Okay, metallic bonding. This is the last section in chapter nine. We spent a lot of time talking about ionic bonding between a metal and a non-metal. And then we spent quite a bit of time, probably more time talking about covalent bonding between non-metals. And the last part is the shortest part, which deals with the bonding in pure metals or alloys, which are mixtures of metals. So if you think about a metal, a pure metal like sodium. Now sodium, pure sodium isn't a metal that you're used to encountering maybe in your everyday life, but what about pure copper? Okay, if you think about the copper wires that are conducting electricity, that's carrying electricity to your tablet or laptop or mainframe, whatever kind of computer you're using, copper is a metal. Okay, and what holds the copper atoms together in, 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 um, in copper metal? What holds the sodium atoms together in uh, sodium metal? And the answer is um, the electron C, and we call the electron C a model of metallic bonding. And we can see here that we have an electron C, no pun intended, uh, for metallic bonding right here in sodium. It says here that all metal atoms in the sample contribute their valence electrons to form uh, a delocalized electron C. Now you see they have that word in quotations. And if you're wondering like, what the heck are you talking about? What it's talking about is if you look at sodium, okay, so this is solid sodium right here, solid sodium. The dark brown spheres, okay, all these dark brown spheres, this is the nucleus of the sodium atom plus the core electrons. The part that's kind of lighter here, the sort of outer part here, that represents the valence electrons because we know that valence electrons are in the highest principal quantum number, so they're in the biggest shell. So they are the ones that are the furthest away from the nucleus. And what we have is between all of these sodium atoms, okay, these are not ions, right? We have sodium atoms, right? They, the nuclei of all of these sodium atoms are going to be attracted to all of the electrons, okay, that are in all of the other sodium atoms. So we have electrons, the valence electrons that are kind of in these, you know, kind of cloudy parts here that are able to move around all throughout the metal. So basically what's happening is you have all the sodium atoms or any kind of metal coming together and the valence electrons are gonna be shared between all of the atoms, okay? We have all those different nuclei, all attracting all the electrons and it holds it all together. So what holds a metal together is basically columbic forces between the positive charge of the nucleus and the electrons, but again, some of the electrons, the valence electrons, are shared between all of the metals. So if we have a valence electron here, let's say, right, that valence electron can share, you know, can move around. And that's why metals are such good conductors of electricity, because the valence electrons are shared in what we call the electron C, right? You think about a C, the water, the waves can float, can move around from place to place. And that's why we use the C as um, a moniker for um, the bonding in metals because the electrons are shared. They can float around that C. And again, that explains why metals are good conductors of electricity. Now, if you think about Coulombic forces, like you heard me say Coulombic forces, you might be thinking, well, what about, what about ionic compounds, Mr. Dion? Didn't you bring up Coulomb's law there? I did bring up Coulomb's law when we spoke about um, ionic compounds. The difference was the anions and cations were in a fixed position. Okay. An anion, right, with a negative charge, let's say you have sodium chloride, okay? The sodium cation and the chloride anion, those were in fixed position. So there was no movement of electrons in a solid ionic compound where there is movement of electrons in a solid metallic compound, okay? Now, the metal ions or the nuclei with the core electrons lie in that orderly array in that mobile C, but the atoms share their valence electrons, okay? And the metal is held together by the attraction between the metal cations, if you will, or the, and when it says cations, what that means is nuclei, nuclei plus core electrons, okay? Core electrons, okay? And the C of valence electrons. So again, the C of electrons are the valence electrons. Those are the ones that are free to move around. Give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on the concept. Just follow me on the concept of the electron C and metallic body. Good, thanks, Isabel. I like it. You just write thumb, okay? At least I understand what you're trying to say. Absolutely. Good, okay. Well, you know, what's cool about this electron C is that it helps us to understand the properties of metals. And I'm sure you're all 
kind of familiar with some of the properties of metals. You know, for sure, it says here that metals are generally solids with moderate to high melting points, but much higher um, boiling points. Let's just park it on that just for a second, okay? Why are metals generally solids? Well, we think about that strong Coulombic interaction between the nucleus and the core electrons to all of those valence electrons, right? So we have that strong electrostatic force which holds those metal um, atoms together, but in order for us to, to melt it, okay, we're not having to separate the atoms, we just have to convert them from the solid to the gas phase, okay? So even in a liquid phase, metals are still gonna have all their atoms close to each other and we still have that electron C. So that's why the melting points of metals aren't nearly as high, generally speaking, as ionic compounds, right? If anybody has ever melted lead before, it doesn't take very much heat to melt lead, okay? Something, and Camden says, what about gallium? That's a really good example. Gallium, you can melt it in the palm of your hand, right? It melts at body temperature, right? Again, it says here, moderate to high melting points. Some metals like mercury are liquids at room temperature, okay? And those are kind of exceptions, but still the, the rationale still stands that gallium has a really low melting point because even in the liquid phase, the atoms are still next to each other, right? They still have the sharing of all of those valence electrons, but gallium has a very high boiling point, right? And they have, it says here, they have much higher boiling points. It's very hard to get a, um, a metal to go into the gaseous phase. And that's because you have to break those Coulombic forces, right? You're not breaking those Coulombic forces when you're going from a solid to a liquid, but when you go from a liquid to a gas, oh, then you've got to, okay? Now, what about trends in the periodic table? It says here that melting points decrease going down a group and they increase across a period. Let's pack it on that. I said I was only gonna take 10 minutes. I'm kinda, I'm gonna probably take a little longer here. This is interesting. Okay, melting points of metals decrease going down a group. Let's stop on that. If we go down a group, if we go down from, you know, uh, let's say take group one. If we go from lithium, from lithium to sodium, to potassium, to rubidium, to cesium, right? If we go down a group, what's happening is that the atoms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That means that the valence electrons are farther and farther and farther away from the nucleus. How is that going to affect the electrostatic interaction between all of those quote unquote cations? What I, and what I mean by that are the nuclei with the core electrons and the valence electrons. Well, if the valence electrons are farther away from the nucleus, the, elect the electrostatic interaction isn't going to be as strong. And that is why um, as we go down a group, generally speaking, the melting point of a metal will decrease. Now let's think about um, melting points going across a period. Now this is a little bit tougher because as we go across a period, and this is a real generalization, because um, you're thinking, well, if I go across the second period from lithium to beryllium, the boron, and then I get into carbon, carbon's not a metal, nitrogen isn't a metal, oxygen isn't a metal. All right, so again, these are trends, okay? These are hard and fast rules, but generally speaking, as we go across a period, let's say we go from sodium to magnesium, the reason the melting point of magnesium is gonna be higher than that of sodium is because it's got two valence electrons, right? And it's gonna be smaller, right? It's got an increased effective nuclear charge, and therefore, since the radius of the atom is smaller, the electrostatic interaction is going to be stronger. Anyhow, I have some more information about that on the next slide, but I just thought I'd talk about it here first because it's so fun. Metals can be shaped without breaking. Think about it. You can bend a metal, right? You're like, oh, yes, I can. That's how I broke it in jail, right? I just grabbed those bars, broke and bent them, okay? Didn't break them, but, I, you know, there's an old song, I ain't broke, but badly bent, right? Anyhow, um, we can shape a metal with, with relative ease. You know, you think about it. Um, if if you if anybody's ever messed around with sheet metal, I don't know what you guys do in your personal lives, but if you've ever um, tried to maybe install ductwork or something like that, bending a piece of sheet metal is not very difficult. But when it comes time to tearing it, you know you can't, definitely can't tear it with your bare hands. You need to have you know a pair of metal shears or something. So shaping a metal isn't all that difficult, and the reason why is because. The electron C allows the metal ions to slide past each other, and that's what's being shown right here. You remember the sodium chloride crystal when we treated that with a hammer, how it cracked? 
Remember, because the cations and the anions got, uh, you know, slid, and then the cations were next to the cations, and anions were next to anions, and then it kind of poof, blew apart. Well, look at a metal. These are all the, the quote unquote cations, if you will, right? And again, I keep repeating myself, but I want to make sure that you understand that what I mean by a cation is a cation in quotations, right? It's the nucleus plus the core electron. Well, even if you shape or hit the metal with a hammer, it's not going to shatter, right? It's going to be, you know, hammered, you know, into a something thinner. It's going to be able to slide past the, the, the metal atoms are able to slide past one another because you still have cations next to cations, okay? But you still have all that electron C that's going to hold those metals together, metal atoms together. Um, I already mentioned this, that metals are good conductors of electricity in both the solid and liquid phases, and that's because the electron C is still intact in whether you're dealing with the liquid or the solid phase, and they're good conductors of heat for the same reasons. All right. Anyhow, let's move on from there. This is, I think, is this my last slide? Yeah, this is kind of my last slide of content for the entire chapter. Um, yeah, so this basically covers what I just went over. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but, uh, you know, I just can't help it. This slide just deals with nothing more than the melting point periodic trend from Coulomb's law. So generally speaking, as we go down a group, um, the um, melting point is going to decrease. Let's just look at, um, well, this is the example that I used on the last slide, isn't it? Going from uh, lithium to sodium to potassium, you can see that the melting point, melting point is up here on this axis, it, it drops. And why is that? Because the metals get bigger and bigger and bigger. The Coulombic forces drop. And I also used this as an example on the last slide too, didn't I? Okay, maybe. There we go. So if you just compare, I don't know, let's compare potassium and calcium. So you go across the period from potassium, which is a metal, to calcium that's a metal. You see the melting point for calcium is much higher than that for potassium. Why? Because you have more valence electrons in um, calcium. You have two as opposed to one in potassium. And so you have an extra proton in the nucleus. And so it's, it, it's going to have a higher effective nuclear charge. The atomic radius is smaller. And therefore, the Coulombic um, forces are going to be increased. Nothing more than that. And you can see that there's some anomalies here, right? Remember, this is general chemistry. It's not about Mr. Dion getting involved in every single little nuance to frustrate you or something like that. No, no, no. It's about you understanding the trend, right? Um, anyhow, I'm just going to rewrite Coulomb's law here for you. Q1 times Q2 over, over the just Q2. Here we go. How did I have it written before? Oh man, it's Friday. How did I write it before? Um, I think I did it like this, anion, cation, distance, anion, cation, like that. Okay, who wants to try some practice problems? Me. Uh, so let's try a practice problem. Didn't we already do this one? We did that problem. Well, let's try something else. Who wants to switch gears entirely and just try some of these problems at the end just for fun? These don't deal directly with metals, but yeah, Kenner says yes. I say yes too. Let's go for it. This is the land of the freak. Let's, uh, yeah, before we do chapter 10, why don't we just pause here, park it on a few questions just for fun. It's a Friday. Question number 9.1. Pretend you're on an exam, you guys. Which compound in the following list is not possible? I'm going to give you a second to take a look at it. If anybody has an answer, feel free to just go for it. I got no problem with that. My students just giving it the old college try. Um, oh, sweet. Man, you guys are good students. Everybody wrote the right answer. Everybody put C. Maybe you don't even need me to go over all these. So calcium bromide, right? Calcium is in group 2A. It's going to charge a... So I'll just write it like this, plus two, uh, two plus charge. Bromine has a, a one minus charge or a minus one charge. So that works out. Potassium is plus, iodine is minus. Well, what about aluminum oxide? Well, aluminum, aluminum has a three plus charge and oxygen has a two minus charge, right? Oxide. 
And so you could use a little technique that uh, Dr. Silverberg uses where she swaps these. Does anybody use this? Does anybody use her swapping the charges and then using those? Okay. Uh, hey, one person does, two people do. Good enough. No problem. I, I, I don't teach that a whole lot, but hey, Dr. Silverberg probably knows more about chemistry in her little finger than I do in my whole body, so shouldn't be making any harsh judgments here, should I? Okay, so the answer was C. That is impossible. Lithium chloride, magnesium oxide, those are both reasonable, right? Lithium is a charge of plus one. Chlorine, chloride is minus one. Um, magnesium is a two plus charge. Oxygen is a two minus charge. So those all work out. So it was aluminum oxide. Give me a thumbs up if you think you could nail that one. Like, boy, Mr. Dion, put that question on the next exam and I will be killing it. Great. Good. Always nice when students feel confident about a question. Makes me happy. What about uh, this compound? Did anybody name this compound or give me the correct answer? Does anybody have an idea what this guy would be called? Yeah. Okay, I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, I see that everybody's answering E. And you're, you're right. Don't you hate these kind of questions where the answer is none of the above? These are kind of goofy, goofy questions, but hey, we use them sometimes. None of the above. Right, who could tell me what would be the correct name for this um, compound? Does anybody have an idea what the correct name would be? I'm sure somebody knows. Who's got an idea? Okay, I'm seeing some people saying nickel dioxide. There's a problem there, though. Remember, nickel, nickel is a transition metal. Isn't it nickel to oxide? No, it's not going to be that either. So, is it nickel four dioxide? It's it's not nickel nickel four dioxide either. Okay, it's nickel four oxide. Okay, dioxide. Right. Whenever you use the word dioxide, okay. That is only used in a covalent compound, okay? That's used for covalent compounds. This is a metal, and oxygen is a non a nonmetal. But remember, the transition metals can have more than one oxidation state, except for zinc, cadmium, and silver. Those are the exceptions that we looked at. And so oxygen has a two minus charge, and there's two of them. So that gives you an overall charge of minus four. So that tells you that this must be plus four. So this compound is nickel, nickel, four oxide, not dioxide, because again, that's for something covalent. Like say, for example, if you have this SO2, that's sulfur, sulfur dioxide, but that's because both sulfur and oxygen are non-metals. Okay, so be careful with that whole dioxide thing. Anyhow, hey, maybe it's a good idea that we're trying these. No, maybe it's not a bad thing. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that name then. Because I've got some. Does that help? Does that clear it up a little bit for the people who. And there's no shame in being confused. Chemistry is a difficult subject. Mr. Dion has said a lot of things in this class, but he's never said, oh, chemistry is easy. No, 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 no. I never said that. Okay. And that's what I do for a living. Uh, let's try here. What's, what is the electron configuration for lead 2 plus? What's the electron configuration for lead 2 plus? Maybe we could do this one as a group. This one might be kind of hard to answer by um, on teams. Well, if we look at lead in the periodic table, lead's in the same group as carbon. It's in group 4A. And the noble gas that precedes, precedes lead 2 plus or lead is xenon. So we know that it's going to start with xenon. So those are all cool. Now, lead itself. The atomic number of lead is 82, so 82. So if I have lead 2 plus, that means I'm going to lose two electrons. So that means I've only got 80 electrons, okay? And so let's give it the old college try here. Um, let's start by doing lead. So maybe we'll write that out. So we'll have xenon. What comes after xenon? We're going to have our cesium and our barium. So that's 6s2. 
to put this. Come on. Sorry. 6S2. Then after that, we have to go through the lanthanides. So we have 4F14 like that. Then we have to go through all of the um, uh, 5B electrons. So we have 5B10. And then uh, remember, I'm doing lead, not lead 2 plus. Then you have to go into the 6P and then 6P2. But remember, you're going to lose the two electrons that have the highest principal quantum number that are the highest energy. And since P is higher energy than S, we're going to lose these two electrons. So this will be our answer, xenon, 6S2, 4F14, um, and um, 5B10. Now, you notice that in B, this is the correct answer, that they're in a little bit different order. Okay, you see that they put the 4F first, and then they put the 5D, and then they put the 6S last. That's okay. That's okay. All they're doing is organizing it in terms of the number. Don't think that that's wrong. Or you'll, if you put the answer, if you wrote what I have, if you were wrong, you were not wrong. You're perfectly correct. Okay. There's there's no there's no problem with doing either of those. Uh, let's give another one a try here. Copper, copper one plus. Hmm. You know what? I'm going to wait for my students to answer this one. Does anybody have an idea what's the electron configuration of copper one plus? Yes, 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 good. Good, good. I sound like that bad guy in that movie. Good, good. Okay. Anyhow, um, no, hold on. Huh? Sorry, hold on. No, no, I see an issue here. Sorry, I thought you were, I looked at the wrong one. Do you guys remember that copper was an exception? I think there's an interesting exception with copper. Uh, okay, I'm getting all kinds of answers. Let's just do copper. Okay, well, let's start with copper. The electron configuration of copper, the noble gas that precedes copper is argon. Then Copper is element number 29. So you might think it would be 4s2, 3d, 9, like that. There's a problem with that. Remember, copper is an exception. Exceptional. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to take one of the electrons from here and plop it into there. And so the correct, the correct um, electron, con son of a gun. the correct electron configuration for copper is argon. And then we have 4s1, 3d, 10, like that. This is correct. I could do that Drake meme, right? On this one, you put Drake with his orange jacket and holding his hands up, you know, like with his head kind of tilted to the side, going like, no. And then we could put the Drake meme next to this one, right? Where he's like, two thumbs up, yeah, okay? So if this is the correct electron configuration of copper, which one of these is going to be lost when we lose one electron to form copper plus? Right, and we're going to lose the 4s1 electron, and so it will be argon 3d10, like that. So the correct answer is D. Uh, all right, anyhow, why don't we call it quits on that for today?